which break, we go ahead with direct of this witness, Mr. Neff. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Cavalier, since uh, we stopped briefly, can you still hear me okay? Yes. If you could walk us through how the foundational literature in your profession explains how to incorporate confessions in your ultimate findings. Well, a confession is simply part of the history. And so if there's been an accusation of a homicide, then the description of what was heard or what was said needs to be compared with the evidence that ought to um, One of the texts, well, I would, uh, one of the books in forensic pathology um, that is uh, called uh, Forensic Pathology of Infancy and Childhood has a chapter on asphyxia. And in that chapter, there's in bold letters, does the confession match the, or does the confession match the, um, or is the autopsy consistent with the confession? And I think that it's not just the confession, it's, it's all of the history that is available. Just, uh, any doctor needs as much history as possible, and so all of that needs to be compared with the evidence at autopsy before a decision is made. If you were to just ignore a confession or not review a confession in coming to your conclusions, um, are there any standards of practice in forensic pathology that would take issue with that stance? Um, I can't quote standards, but I think it would be um, irresponsible to know of information that was being ignored in uh, establishing the diagnosis. As far as your experience over the past 10 years, could you walk us through what experience you have in conducting child autopsies, particularly those relating to asphyxia and strangulation? Yes, well we have uh, many child autopsies. It varies, of course, um, from week to week and month to month. Um, offhand, I keep um, a running list of my open cases and pages about 17 cases long and most cases have, uh, or most pages have the child or a baby. So maybe 10% uh, of our cases are children or babies. Um, of those, I have had a number of asphyxial deaths, um, as I'm, my colleagues have had some that I've observed, but of my personal cases, I have had um, a toddler who was hanged on the edge of his packet clay crib when he reached over the edge of the crib and caught his neck at the corner and his neck was compressed with um, right where the carotid arteries are and the weight of his head after he lost consciousness caused him to be suspended. Um, I had several cases that were signed out as consistent with asphyxia. One was a child found um, in a bathtub and he had a TPI, he had injuries uh, in various locations. Um, that history was not able to be, uh, the history in that case was not able to be corroborated because um, his family left the country immediately after his death. However, um, his findings were consistent with and this case of death and were probably strangulation. Um, I had uh, the two suing girls that we discussed. Uh, the end of 2019, a 12-year-old um, 
committed suicide by hanging. Um, when I was in fellowship, when I was in studying, um, an infant fell through a defective crib such, as, such that he was hanged on his mattress between the crib and the crib rail and the mattress. Um, I had a, a hanging suicide when I was working in Indiana of an eight-year-old. Um, I had another child who was uh, found under uh, confusing circumstances in a hotel with uh, evidence of asphyxia, and there was ultimately um, witness statements and um, perpetrator statements that indicated that he was actually sat on and, and his neck was compressed. So, um, those are the ones that I am aware of at this point in time. Um, I don't have access to my records from uh, Indiana when I worked there, so there could have been more, but that's what I recall. As far as your findings and all these asphyxial deaths, were there injuries within the inner neck uh, that you found as a, you know, similar or simply existing as they do in this death? Well, as I said, I don't have all my records, but in the case of the child in the hotel, um, there was no neck injury. There was injury elsewhere, and there were petechiae. The child in the tongue, again, had petechiae and injury elsewhere, not in the neck. The two suing girls um, had, uh, one of them had one dot of hemorrhage and the other had none. Um, a child in the corner of the crib had no injury of the neck. He had florid petechiae of the face and ears, or uh, scalp around the ears and the eyes. Um, the baby, oh, I forgot to mention, there was a baby who had compressional asphyxia where her chest was crushed and um, there were no physical signs on, on her. She was quite little, several months old. Um, and uh, the 12-year-old who committed suicide by hanging had um, lots of petechiae from the ligature furrow up, but no internal neck injury. Concerning the confession in this case, I wanted to draw your attention to several locations of the transcript. I will note those for purposes of the record, and then if I may, just read those and then ask if, if there is any significance based on your expertise uh, concerning those statements. And I'll direct opposing counsel to the July 26 transcription, uh, page 229. And beginning at line 9, 940. I'm sorry, what page? Page 229. And then it'll begin at line 9940. And beginning there, uh, Mike Searin notes, tell us more about her eyes. Kelsey Thomas responds, uh, they just got really big, you know, they like they were, like she was terrified staring at me. Uh, Mike Searin, did she ever say anything? Kelsey Thomas, she didn't. I mean, she just, just laid there and she was breathing really heavily and then her eyes got really big and that's when I just, I pushed off of her one last time and then I went and closed the door and left. Don Schnicker, did you hear her stop breathing? I apologize, I'm going further. And then the next section that I wanted to read to you, and we'll return back. It's page 241. 
at line 10496 to 10499. Michael Searin, her eyes did it move side to side up and down? Kelsey Thomas, no, they were just staring right at me. They got really big and then like I said, I, I pushed off the one last time. At least in you reviewing those statements, Dr. Cadillier, what significance do they hold out to you in comparison to your physical findings in your autopsy? Well, as far as the eyes go, um, I can't correlate um, what her eyes were doing with what her injuries had been up to that point. Um, certainly, not eyes not moving and staring are suggestive of the, or consistent with, the lack of ability to track, um, as we discussed previously. Um, I don't know how that correlates with the timing of the injuries, but um, it would make sense that at the time close to her death, if her eyes were open, either um, her brain function wasn't such that her eyes could move, or perhaps she wasn't alive, or, um, or additional information that I don't have. And then going to page 253, Line 10993 to 1104. Kelsey Thomas, yeah, I was, you know, I, I mean I wasn't. I didn't hold on, you know. To me, I didn't think I held on that long. Don Schnicker, did she go down? Kelsey Thomas, she started to. I mean, she was starting to, you know, to get wobbly. At least, you know, that's what it kind of felt like. Mike Searin, can you describe that to us? Kelsey Thomas, um, when she started kind of moving and shaking, um, I, I just don't know how, exactly how to. I'll skip a little ahead to line 11014. Michael Searin, so she starts wobbling and then what happens? Kelsey Thomas, and then I let go, I had to let go, and I picked her up and I put her in her bed. Of what significance is that description to you, Dr. Cadillier? Well, the shaking is consistent with seizure activity and or uh, some decerebrate decorticate activity. It, it's likely that one of those is the case because she had been, at that point, apparently uh, strangled or uh, suspended. The wobbliness could be part of that movement. It also could reflect one of the periods of collapse with loss of consciousness and or uh, loss of muscle activity. So depending upon the sequence of events, it certainly is in keeping with what would be expected in an asphyxial episode but where in the sequence of events, I can't. As far as reviewing the initial history, reviewing your findings from the autopsy and the literature that informs that, and reviewing the subsequent confession, uh, what conclusions did you come to in terms of your autopsy findings? Strangulation. And would that be strangulation as a hanging, a subset, uh, as an accident, or at the hands of another? Objection, Your Honor. Objection. Wait a minute. There's been an objection, and I can't hear the objection. Go ahead. The motion in limine, Your Honor. If I may respond, yeah. Um, well, I'm very confused uh, even about the question because I believe she just said the cause of death was strangulation. I've heard three different kinds of strangulation, and she hasn't 
specify, um, and um, you, you may go ahead and ask to clarify which of the three that we were talking about. Thank you, Your Honor. As to the objection, I would just note that motions of limine tend to be for juries based on their inadvertent effects of, on an evidentiary issue. They don't apply in this type of manner. Your Honor, there's other motion and limine issues that uh, the parties, I believe, were intending to abide by. So if we're throwing the motion and limine out completely, that's a different dynamic. What is your objection, Mr. Cook? My objection is uh, specifically with regard to the motion and limine in the hearing that we had, uh, this expert cannot opine as to uh, manner of death or cause of death. I believe we're talking about cause of death. Cause of death, correct, Your Honor. She can't testify as to manner of death. She can testify as to cause of death. So At the hands of another, in my position, Your Honor, would be that to characterize it as at the hands of another is implicitly opining as to homicide. I have heard that there are three different kinds of strangulation, hanging, ligature, or manual. She can certainly testify as to which of the three was the cause of death. Go ahead. Dr. Cadillier, uh, if you could hear the judge, um, I'm not sure if you could, but if you could specify, since you said the cause of death is strangulation, and we've discussed throughout your testimony that there are three subcategories of strangulation. In this situation, uh, what would be your opinion as to the cause of death more specific to those subcategories? Well, as I mentioned before, strangulation can be referred to as specific, and it can be a classification of asphyxia. There are other ways to classify asphyxia. In this case, I classified the death as strangulation without specifying further because I suspect that it was a combination of factors. There was suspension as evidenced by the ligature furrow canting upward on the neck and that was consistent with the suspension that was described in the um, confession. There was injury of the neck consistent with um, either ligature or manual strangulation um, as evidenced by uh, multiple sites of hemorrhage as well as hemorrhage in the vocalis muscles and around the carotid arteries and the fatigue of the larynx. So I did not sub-classify it because it's not um, a simple um, diagnosis in this case, I believe that um, it is consistent with strangulation, but which type I did not specify on purpose. As far as the portion that is consistent with suspension in the confession, could you uh, walk us through what was stated by Kelsey Thomas that you found to be consistent with the evidence of suspension? Um, I believe you mentioned um, a quote where the um, pajamas were around her neck and um, she, Kelsey described lifting her up and that was consistent with suspension by the pants that were around her neck. Also, uh, if she were falling while the ligature was maintained in, um, by being held, then that would also result in suspension. And just to make sure the record's clear, uh, I'll read a portion and you can confirm or correct me if it's the portion you're referencing or if it's not. It'd be page 261 of the same document we've referenced earlier, line 11341. Uh, Don Schnicker, do you remember lifting her completely off the ground though? Kelsey Thomas, um, I, I, yeah. When I picked her up, um, that's when she started shaking and kicking. Uh, is Dr. Cadillier, is that the portion you're referencing? That would be consistent. Also, the autopsy findings were consistent with a suspension. Pulling her back, recall that um, one does not have to be completely suspended 
with the feet off the ground, although I think from that statement she probably was at least once. But um, just pulling on the neck such as such that then uh, body and head and the pendant compared with that ligature um, site of suspension would result in a suspension injury. Ultimately, were your findings consistent in your medical opinion with a suspended hanging that did not involve any form of manual or ligature strangulation? Not in the way that it was described, no. In this case. One moment, Your Honor. Cross. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Cavalier, early in your testimony, you had discussed uh, how quickly the onset of unconsciousness takes place when um, a person's, I believe the carotid arteries are impinged in the neck. Is that correct? Do you recall that discussion, doctor? If that was a question, I could not make out anything. I'm sorry. I'll speak up, doctor. <clears throat> doctor, early in your testimony, you had, you spoke about when the neck is compressed and it generally takes a... Me. It's all garbled. I can't understand anything. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Cook, you could perhaps sit in a chair so that she can see you. I'll be able to read my lips. Dr. Cavalier, can you hear me? I can now, yes, thank you. Earlier in your testimony, you talked about a particular time frame in which uh, a person who has a compression around their neck would lose consciousness, correct? Yes. And what is that time frame? Well, if the carotid arteries are compressed um, completely, and bilaterally, then loss of consciousness occurs in approximately three to ten seconds. Okay. But and if there is a struggle of some sort and or change in that compression, then certainly loss of consciousness can occur over a much longer period of time. Or it can occur more than once. And if You've previously expressed that that period of time was between 3 and 15 seconds and not 3 and 10 seconds. Does that, uh, is, is that square with your recollection? Um, I usually describe 3 to 10 seconds. Um, 5 seconds additional may be reflective of rare references, but most of them are within 3 to 6, and some say 3 to 10. And that is, again, assuming that the carotid arteries are compressed, correct? 
completely and symmetrically. Do you know for a fact that in this case, Chloe Chandler's carotid arteries were compressed uh, bilaterally and completely? No, so she could have been um, conscious for a longer period of time. And certainly, uh, you had talked about different types of suspension, and, and in medical literature, they talk about a, a full or a partial suspension, correct? Yes. And in a partial suspension situation, that would allow for um, sort of intermittent pressure, and that would also expand the period of time before somebody would lose consciousness, correct? Not necessarily, no. Um, uh, incomplete suspension simply means that the feet are not dangling off the ground. It can mean that there's less uh, pressure than would be uh, expected with complete suspension, which is why some of those cases have the TPI more so than other cases. But the loss of consciousness could be just as rapid partial suspension. In no way can a partial suspension result in intermittent pressure? Every situation is different. For instance, if someone it has their, if someone is committing suicide and they have a ligature around their neck and they're kneeling on the floor and they're just leaning in to the ligature, there's nothing that keeps them from leaning back out and changing their mind. So a lot of times there's intermittent pressure. There are also times when um, that situation could result in the ligature break and, and therefore loss of consciousness did not occur or came back or consciousness returned and the person repaint themselves with a different ligature. So cases can be different and um, but if the ligature is symmetrically applied to the neck with enough force, which is typically um, about 10 pounds of pressure to uh, compress the carotid arteries. And 10 pounds happens to be about the same weight as the head. So in that circumstance, typically loss of consciousness occurs in seconds. And again, in Chloe Chandler's particular case, you don't know the dynamics of whether or not that pressure was bilaterally and it was not intermittent. That's, you don't know that, correct? I can say it was bilateral because of the bilateral injuries. What the time frame was between the beginning of the episode and her death, I do not know. Okay. Now, you talked about petechiae, and petechiae are nonspecific, correct? Correct. And nonspecific generally means that there could be a number of different causes for that particular presentation, correct? Yes. Now, you had also talked about studies that indicate um, I think, it, I think you had indicated, let me find it here. I believe one study you referenced that you were involved in had 12 children involved and only three of those had internal injuries uh, as a result of a hanging. Is that your testimony? I was not involved in all of those cases. I trained um, for part of my uh, medical career in Indiana with the authors, and I was aware of at least one of the cases that they referenced in the literature when I was in that office. And yes, um, they had the majority of the children who were paying, who they reported, had no internal injuries. And, but another way to say that is that 25% or so in that particular study, you said three out of the 12. So 25% of those children or those subjects uh, had internal injuries as a result of hanging, correct? Had some injuries. 
So, and that, that's not uh, statistically insignificant, 25%, correct? Their injury was not um, bilateral and through all layers of strap muscle. You had testified uh, regarding some areas of power around, along the uh, litigated furrow, correct? The litigated furrow, yes. And just so uh, the court is clear, those uh, indications of power are more consistent with uh, the size of Chloe's fingers than they would of an adult finger, correct? Um, I believe that's likely, yes. And in fact, the orientation of those fingers would be more consistent with Chloe reaching up her hand, reaching up and trying to remove the ligature from her neck, correct? Yes. And the act of somebody trying to resist that force that's around their neck, you could surmise that that would happen in an accidental hanging versus a strangulation. Those impulses for a person to save themselves would exist in both circumstances, correct? Yes. They could. Again, it depends upon the length of time that a person is. Conscious. And again, that length of consciousness, that period can take a lot longer if the pressure is intermittent, correct? Yes. And again, I believe, doctor, correct me if I'm wrong, it is your assumption that in that period of either three to 15 or three to 10 seconds before a person loses consciousness, assuming that uh, there is full compression, you're assuming that in those three to 10 or 15 seconds that the person is not flailing about in any way that could cause themselves injury, correct? I think that's typically the case if there's uh, compression of the neck without other um, circumstances that would cause uh, this change in that. If it was simply a ligature, most often there's not flailing unless there's resistance to a perpetrator. And when, when we're talking about hangings, the majority of the literature that you've seen involves people who are attempting to take their own lives, correct? Yes. And it would make sense, just as if, from a layperson's perspective, that the person trying to take their life would struggle less than the person who is accidentally ha hanged and trying to save themselves from death. Does not, that not make sense? It can, although um, sometimes accidental hangings occur because loss of consciousness can, can happen so rapidly. For instance, in the case of the baby uh, who hanged himself over the edge of the crib, he was reaching down for his sippy cup that had fallen over the edge of the um, playpen. His arms were reaching down. Um, he could have stood up and saved himself, but his neck was compressed for a short enough period of time that he just passed out. In this particular case, you have no per specific idea as, as to how long Chloe Chandler was in that ligature before she became unconscious, correct? Correct. Strangulations can sometimes be quite prolonged. And again, the majority of the literature that you've reviewed and the observations that you've uh, been privy to make because of people posting videos of their suicides, things like that, those would be along the lines of purposeful uh, hanging situations. That's what the literature and that's what you were speaking to earlier, correct? If I understand your question, uh, correctly, then the answer is no, because most of the um, 
literature that is there includes all kinds of hangings to get, such as accidents, suicides, and homicides. However, the majority of hangings are suicides. So I can't, I don't know if that answers. Well, let, let me clarify my question a little bit, uh, Dr. Kettleweir. Um, I'm sorry, can you read that back? I apologize, Smith, Dr. No, that's okay. The answer the question. The question, please. <clears throat> Again, the majority of the literature that you reviewed and the observations that you have been privy to make because of the people posting videos of their suicides, things like that, those would be along the lines of purposeful hanging situations. That's what the literature and that's what you were speaking to earlier, correct? Okay. And doctor, I don't imagine that you heard the court reporter, did you? No, I didn't. And, and that was for my purpose anyway. My original question had to do with the literature and your observations, but I'll speak more to your observations. You had testified about how, um, I guess, more in modern society where uh, people are more connected with the media and where people take their lives, they sometimes post their suicide on some sort of social media, which gives doctors an opportunity to actually view a person and how their body reacts to, to that uh, stress, correct? There have been a few of those situations, yes. Okay. And in those, as far as what doctors can observe about death, those aren't accidental hangings. Those are purposeful hangings. Somebody is trying to take their life, correct? I believe that they were all suicidal. Sometimes people will um, film themselves if they are trying to succeed um, recreationally. And things go wrong and they die, but I believe that the ones uh, were uh, suicidal, I can't, I'm, I'm not positive of that without reviewing each one. Okay. Now, with regard to the ligature mark that appeared on Chloe Chandler's neck, I believe you opined that a, just a common hanging, I think is how you described it, would not result in that without some sort of movement to cause friction, correct? I would favor that just because it was in two different angles. It was horizontal over the front of the neck and then upwardly canted, which suggests that the ligature would, had moved. Um, however, there could be other ways for that to occur if there was a folding um, in the neck or if, if uh, the ligature was applied and reapplied. Seizure activity and posturing, uh, sort of events that happen as somebody's experiencing death, also res result in, in movement, correct? Yes. But it's your opinion that that movement would not be substantial enough to move the lig ligature as well? The movement is not upon the ligature and the neck, it's more peripheral. Okay, so you're... The movement of the ligature would occur either when the ligature slips, such as with a suspension hanging, and it be the ligature begins lower and then gravity takes over and slips up, or in the case of um, uh, two individuals being involved, there can be changes in pressure, changes in movement and posture that cause change, the literature to change uh, its position. So would it not be true, doctor, that your opinion depends on the assumption that Chloe Chandler did not crash about for the three to 10 seconds or so that you estimate that she would have been conscious before losing consciousness and that the seizure activity and posturing that resulted in movement would not have resulted in any movement substantial enough to help create some of the lig ligature furrow marks that you would have seen, correct? That was complicated. Could you repeat the question? Sure. Your ultimate opinion depends on the assumption that one, that Chloe Chandler did not thrash about or cause herself any injuries before she lost consciousness, and two, 
that any seizure and posturing that would have happened may have caused movement, but not movement substantial enough to impact that litigation or that ligature furrow. Is that correct? No. Um, if she were, she could be conscious and thrashing about prior to losing consciousness. Um, and the second part of your question? Would be the seizure activity and the posturing also while it could create movement, would not create movement substantial enough to, to create an injury? No. Um, the situation where injury does not occur is when the pressure is constant. It is the friction or movement that causes, that causes injury. So when there is a ligature, such as with a hanging, and it's relatively static, we often don't see injury in the neck. And you don't know if this was a... I'm sorry, go ahead. And that's uh, well uh, described in, in the literature. Um, it is some type of movement that involves the neck that would cause injury to the neck. So it would be either increased pressure over a small surface area, such as a blow, or it would be a ligature moving, or it would be hands moving um, in causing some kind of force, such as friction, that would result in injury. So are you assuming then that Chloe Chandler's death, was, or that the description that Kelsey Thomas gave indicated to you a static hanging? Um, I'm not familiar with the term static hanging. But you just used it, Doctor. Be, I don't believe I did. A hanging usually results in the ligature being relatively stable, except when it slips, and that's probably when injury occurs. Most hangings have no internal neck injury because there's relatively little movement friction that occurs to injure the tissues below um, the skin. And when you say not often, if we refer to your studies, we're talking about 20 to 25 percent in which injuries do occur, correct? Well, possibly, and it's usually um, unilateral. For instance, a uh, common forensic textbook, Dolanac, Matches, and Lou, says, quote, in hangings, the anterior neck dissection is usually negative, unquote. Quote, homicidal hangings are extremely rare, but may be suspected when the investigation and autopsy findings appear more consistent with a struggle, such as an excessive amount of external and or internal neck injury. That's one reference. I can go on. The situation in hanging is usually suspension, either complete or partial, and there's rarely neck injury when there is, it's often unilateral, and it's a small percentage of the cases. Evidence of suspension is exceedingly rare in a manual strangulation? And in a manual strangulation, there are certain injuries that you would have expected to see that you did not see in this case. For instance, the cornu, the pointed ends that can be broken off during a manual strangulation, those were intact in Chloe Chandler's case, correct? Those could be broken in hangings or in manual strangulations, but it would be rare for a child to have any fractures. 
Um, something like uh, 10 percent of hangings or so have fractures of the neck, but those are usually adults who have uh, bony structures and or when there's uh, some kind of uh, uh, suspension that is complete, although it doesn't have to have a fracture. So those fractures can occur with manual strangulation or hangings, much, uh, much in, uh, lower frequency in children. Other than the injuries to the internal neck, were there any other indication on Chloe Chandler's body that she was involved in a struggle? I don't know how she got the bruises on the top of her head. Those are a bit unusual in um, everyday play. She also had those little abrasions in her mouth. Um, okay. Well, I... The result from having a compression of the mouth, I uh, think of those as a brain struggle. And, but those are uh, non-specific injuries, correct? Yes. You have testified before that children oftentimes in play get bruises on their head, correct? Places that are typically bruised accidentally or in play are over bony prominences that are not protected. So, um, for instance, the cheekbone would be bruised more often than the top of the head. The neck is pretty protected and it's rarely injured in play. Certainly, it can happen. Um, the knees, the front of the legs are typically bruised accidentally or in play. In autopsy? For example. In autopsy, you examine Chloe Chandler's fingernails, correct? Yes. And why do you do that? I look at nails in all cases. Just uh, it's part of the physical examination. If there's an altercation, sometimes we see injury of the nails. Um, it's not something we see all the time. You may also find underneath the fingernails uh, DNA material of the person that the that the decedent was in a struggle with. Correct. And that's one of the reasons why you, you test for fi the fingernail clippings? Yes. And in this case, there were no findings, correct? I don't know. You're not aware of any findings, I should say, correct? I just don't know. A lot of times, the evidence that we take um, that is sent to the crime lab is not shared with us um, unless it is critical for the diagnosis of um, related to the autopsy, so I often don't know the results of that. The heart, liver, kidneys, the internal organs were removed and none of those indicated uh, a strangulation type of death as opposed to any other manner of death, correct? I don't know of any findings in the liver or kidneys or internal organs that would be diagnostic of strangulation. There was some um, early ischemia of the bowel, which goes along with asphyxia, because the internal organs um, have a way of having their blood supply deviated when there is um, hypoxia or lack of decreased oxygen. And so sometimes we see um, a discoloration uh, that would be consistent with that blood flow deviation. And in this case, there was a little bit, probably because it was in a six field death. You had testified about organ donation and that in cases of homicide, typically um, whether or not your lab would release a decedent for organ donation would depend on the circumstances in the history of the case, correct? Correct. And in this case, Chloe Chandler was released for donation for her uh, knee, for her knees and her heart valves? 
Yes, based on the initial um, description of circumstances and history that we received prior to autopsy. Because the county, the Wapolo County Medical Examiner initially found this case to be an accident, correct? Um, I presume they suspected it was an accident based on um, their experience and what they were told. And you reviewed that report, correct? In preparation for your, your final autopsy report, you reviewed the Wapolo County uh, Medical Examiner's report? They send us what's called an ME1, which is um, an initial uh, description of the location, circumstances, and demographics of uh, the death and the person involved, and a brief um, several paragraph, hopefully, description of uh, what is known at that time. Or thought to be known at that time. Now, you've been asked several times in a lot of different ways about um, how you determined that, uh, or how you became suspicious that, that this was not an accidental hanging. And in several instances, you've talked about how you didn't feel that the injuries were consistent with a soft, broad, sling-like apparatus. You recall that? Yes. What, in your mind, tells you that this was a soft, broad, sling-like apparatus as opposed to being folded over or crimped up or more narrow why, why do you use that descriptor? Um, when I picture a pair of pants that have been tied and used as a ligature, I picture a broad cloth, similar to those cloths that are um, described in the uh, cases from uh, India also. We see lots of um, sheet, sheets that are used as uh, ligatures, for instance, in jail desks. And so cloth ligatures typically have a more broad or non-existent ligature curl. But that doesn't have to be that way. The uh, external signs are less consistent with that but not inconsistent with that in this case. But the internal findings are certainly not consistent with that. In this particular case, you never did examine the pajama pants that were allegedly the ligature around Chloe Chandler's neck, correct? There were quite good um, scene photographs, and so I saw them in the scene photographs, but I did not hold them in my hand, no. And just referencing before, Doctor, uh, we had talked about the bruises on Chloe's head. During your direct examination, you testified that you didn't know the significance of those at all, correct? Correct. They could or they may not be related to this incident at all. Isn't that true? Yes. 
you were asked about on the day that you conducted the autopsy, you, you visited with some members of law enforcement, correct? Yes. And previously in our discussions, you had talked about how sometimes you, you will direct law enforcement to sort of uh, stage an accident or try to test the plausibility of a particular mechanism. You recall that? I don't know about staging. We um, do sometimes ask for what we call a scene reconstruction or a doll reconstruction if, uh, in order to um, get a better and more three-dimensional idea of what the circumstances were, particularly when the scene is uh, not a typical. Are you aware was that done in this case? I don't recall that it was done in this case, no. Um, there was questioning about it. Um, for instance, uh, when it was initially described that Chloe was suspended in the closet, there was um, multiple questions about how she was, um, how she got down and what happened to the ligature and who took it down and I did not hear that that was ever described. So there was no um, reconstruction that I'm aware of other than the descriptions in words. In your testimony when you talked about meeting with law enforcement, you're, you're basically asking them, is there more information that we could gather? Because you're, you're saying things that don't make sense to you, correct? That's part of it, sure. Yes. And then the information that you got back essentially was that uh, Kelsey Thomas confessed and you reviewed a transcript of how she described uh, the incident, correct? I was initially um, told in some detail what she described, but yes. Okay. Doctor, you uh, talked about your experience in <clears throat> conducting autopsies on children, but you're not a pediatric forensic doctor, correct? That's not an area of specialty for you. There are uh, pediatric pathologists who study, uh, who are specialists in pediatric medicine, um, and there are child abuse doctors who are pediatricians who take care of abused or possibly abused live children, and there are forensic pathologists. A person can have a board specialty in pediatrics and forensics, um, but uh, I am a forensic pathologist and in the course of my training and experience, both children and adults um, are under my care, uh, but I don't have any additional board specialties other than anatomic, clinical, and forensic pathology. During your direct examination, doctor, <clears throat> you discussed... I just wanted to clarify that there's no title of a pediatric forensic pathologist other than a person who would carry board certification in pediatrics as well as forensics, as well as general. Which you do not have, correct? I do not have uh, board certification in pediatric pathology. 
during your direct examination, doctor, um, you were asked about the importance of incorporating uh, a person's confession into your findings. Do you recall that testimony? Um, I don't recall those words, but uh, that would be part of the history that would be important. Okay. And I believe what you testified to is that to ignore any confession would be irresponsible to ignore that kind of information, correct? I would agree with that. And as just like just like any um, information, it has to be weighed against the autopsy findings and the um, additional information that includes history and um, testing and, and um, anything that is available um, that would give historic or physical information. On the topic of confession, you were asked about some statements that Kelsey Thomas had made and uh, the state had read from a transcript certain statements that Kelsey Thomas had made and asked your opinion of those. One of which, uh, Kelsey Thomas at one point indicated her eyes got big. Um, and I believe you said that you would need additional information other than the eyes getting big, correct? That could have been part of what I said. Okay. I'm not, I, I, I don't think that was the entire sentence. Is it? Um, as we discussed at that time, that could be related to uh, the um, fixation of the eyes that occurs in the course of asphyxia and brain injury, it could have been um, that she was dead, it could have been um, something else behavioral because I don't know the exact sequence of events other than what um, was summarized by Kelsey Thomas. Exactly. So if Kelsey Thomas in her story is saying, her eyes got big, but that wasn't in conjunction with the uh, death sequence as you would have understood it, then that wouldn't make sense, correct? That wouldn't be indicative of the person engaging in the death se sequence if in fact the stare had occurred at some other time outside of the injury causing death, correct? The uh, description of the eyes being big is consistent with the um, changes expected during a hypoxic event and death sequence, but are not restricted to that. They're non-specific. They're one part of one piece of the puzzle, one part of the description, and that makes sense and fits the description of what happened but is not the only factor or a deciding factor in um, a diagnosis. And as far as the eyes becoming affixed, would it be important if Kelsey Thomas first volunteered that or if police asked her were her eyes fixed or did they move up and down or side to side? Does it, is it important the source of that information? Again, that's just one piece of information. Um, I would, I think either way it depends upon, it's just a piece of, it, it's not uh, critical either way. Likewise, you were asked about the suspension aspect. And again, would it be important if as far as that suspension aspect, Kelsey Thomas volunteered that she lassoed the pajama pants around Chloe's neck and lifted her up, as opposed to a scenario in which officers are telling her their suspension marks, we know you had to lift her up, and she eventually relents and says, yes, I must have lifted her up. I don't know why she said it, but it makes sense according to the autopsy. Is it problematic, doctor, that you conduct this autopsy on the same day as the autopsy, you tell officers what your findings are and what you think the problems with those findings are, 
that the only subsequent action that investigators take is to interrogate Kelsey Thomas and feed her the information that you told them the findings needed to match. Is that problematic? The transcript that I read simply said that the autopsy findings did not fit with the story as given. And that's true. One moment, Doctor. Dr. Cavalier, were you aware that investigators were telling Kelsey Thomas what your findings were and that her story needed to match your findings? No. Is that problematic? I don't think so. You don't think it's problematic if investigators are telling the suspect, this is what the medical reports say happened, and so if we're going to believe your story, they need to match these findings, and telling her what the findings are. That's not problematic to you? They did not tell her what the findings were. How do you know that? Well, I read the transcript. Okay. What is intubation? Um, that is putting a tube in someone. Medical resuscitation works against the pathologist's ability to detect fatal homicidal neck injuries. Isn't that true? Not usually. But they can, correct? It's possible. An oxygen mask can leave abrasions on the mouth and the nasal bridge, correct? Um, I, I guess it would depend upon the mask. Usually masks are over the mouth with a space between. Um, the nasal bridge certainly is the place where a mask often contacts. And can you describe how intubation is performed? Mechanically, how is it done? 
neck is tipped back so that there, the head is tipped back so that the neck is straight, so there's no deviation of the tube from side to side to bump into things, and it's slipped down between um, into the mouth and uh, uh, into the larynx. During resuscitation, an airway tube is placed into the mouth or nose and inserted into the esophagus or trachea to establish a path through which air can be forced under pressure to the lungs. Does that sound correct to you? Well, no, you don't want to put it in the esophagus because that would pump air into the stomach. However, uh, some of the more modern tubes um, terminate at uh, close to the esophagus so that um, they don't have to be as precisely placed as an endotracheal tube. Was Chloe Chandler intubated in this case? Um, I believe so. So, uh, doctor, if Chloe Chandler's medical history that she was indicated that she was intubated two times in this case, you're not aware of that? I, I was at the time, I'm sure, that I did the autopsy, but I, do, I didn't recall that today. Okay. Why would intubation be necessary twice? Just generally speaking, why would somebody be intubated twice? I don't know without reviewing the record. Sometimes there's misplacement the first time. Would it be a safe assumption that a person is intubated twice because the first intubation either was not done correctly or didn't work? That's possible, yes. There was no injury at the laryngeal inlet to suggest that there was a, a bumping or scraping of the endotracheal tube in that location. You noted some nonspecific injury that uh, you indicated could have been due to innovation, correct? Uh, can you refer to me to that statement? Sure. Um, And doctor, I'll refer you to page 11 of your deposition taken October 24, 2019. 
you noted some erythema on the back of the tongue that you indicated could be an injury, but it was also uh, could have happened in innovation? That would be true. Erythema, a little bit of redness at the back of the tongue. Traumatic intubations can result in internal injuries of the deep musculature of the larynx, often completely mimicking the injuries of strangulation. Isn't that true? Um, there can be injuries of the neck, and um, yes, it can be part of the differential diagnosis in strangulation. The skill of the rescue staff and the size and rigidity of the victim dictate how much injury occurs during the intubation procedure. Isn't that true? Yes, injuries are rarely seen uh, due to intubation in children. I uh, autopsy children all the time and uh, intubation injuries. Injuries of the strap muscles of the neck are very rare. I, don't, I can't recall any in recent years. However, you just agreed with me that traumatic intubations can mimic strangulation injury, correct? I said that it is part of the differential diagnosis and consideration, just like every finding is at autopsy. And as far as the skill of the rescue staff, you have no idea what the credentials are of the first responders who provided life-saving measures to Chloe Chandler are, do you? I can't recall at this time. I knew when I was doing the autopsy because I read the EMT report or the emergency reports, but I don't recall right now. The EMT reports discuss the EMT specific uh, qualifications and education? I don't know. And sometimes they do, yes. I mean, they describe what they're. Um... Okay, now it, it sounds like you're making general statements. Are you talking specifically about this case or just generally speaking? I read all of the reports before I completed my autopsy report. Now, you said you reviewed all the reports, doctor. Going back to um, a prior topic, during Kelsey Thomas's July 26th interview, Don Schnicker tells, uh, tells her, tells Kelsey Thomas, the doctors are going to tell us that something came up from behind her with a ligature or a rope or something around her throat and choked her out. That was before Kelsey Thomas ever made any statement about that. Do you find that problematic? I don't know what their interview technique is and why they said that. I did not tell them to say that, and I, so I don't know the significance. So is it your testimony, doctor, that statements like that, in which investigators are telling a suspect what they need to be told to match the medical findings, your testimony is that that, that dynamic is not problematic to you? I don't control what the interviews are, and I did not tell them what to say specifically. I, would, I wondered why they said that when I read it. Doctor, do you find it problematic or not? Objection beyond the scope, lack of foundation. This goes more towards the defense's theory of a false confession that's beyond the expertise of this witness. <clears throat> Sustained as an answer. If doctor, in another point in that interview transcript, Kelsey Thomas is asked, if the doctor came back and says, you know, I think something was behind, pulled all the way around because she's got lines that go up the sides of her neck and behind her ears, which means something was wrapped around her and then straight up, those are your findings, correct? Correct, and those would be findings whether she was hanged accidentally or suspended by another person. In other words, their findings of suspension, how that occurred is the question. 
Just briefly, Doctor. One moment. Uh, doctor, uh, early in your testimony, you had talked about uh, some hemorrhages that existed in the deep muscles in the back of the neck. Do you recall that testimony? Yes. And those were injuries that are not common in manual strangulation, correct? Well, they can be, but um, they're not what I would say are classic injuries. They indicate there was injury in the back of the neck as well as the And that particular injury would be nonspecific in that it could be found in both a strangulation and in a hanging? It would not be a classic um, injury for a hanging, certainly. Um, strangulations can be complicated because uh, they're not one fixed object causing the injury. So there can be very injured injuries with, with uh, manual or ligature strangulation as opposed to hanging from uh, in a suspension. Thank you, Doctor. I have no further questions. <clears throat> Redirect. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Cavalier, going to the 12 person study that was done uh, essentially in your alma mater uh, under your prior, uh, I guess, mentor, the defense noted that 25%, that being three children that had neck injuries, is significant. Your familiarity with the study, uh, if it could inform this answer, was the neck injury as extensive as you find here? Thirteen-year-old um, 
used a belt ligature on a chin-up bar, had two superficial injuries under the chin and no internal injury. A 10-year-old fully suspended by a cloth belt onto a bunk had a faint abrasion on the outside and focal areas, that means um, localized areas of contusion of strap muscle. An 11-year-old had hemorrhage into the strap muscle uh, and connective tissue, and that was not further specified. A 12-year-old had a rope over a doorknob with petechiae and no internal. So, though there are a third of those studied in that particular study that had injury, if I understand your recitation correctly, the level of internal injury that we see here is not the same as the injuries that are reported in that study. Uh, true. Um, I can't say uh, what the strap muscle injury was on the 11-year-old, but they did not describe an hemorrhage around the... Um, would they be as severe as the injuries that are noted in Chloe Chandler, at least as reported in the study? No. And though other studies that you referenced did mention injury from hangings or asphyxia in general, was it common? or even up to a 25% or 15% commonality within those studies for injuries to present in the way that we see them here, in other words, as severe internally? No. Now you were asked if you assume in conducting your autopsy that Chloe Chandler had no seizures. Is that an assumption you are making in reviewing this case. I'm sorry, I, I assumed, what? Granted, these are my notes, so I may not be paraphrasing the question exactly, but it, on the subject of seizure activity, I believe you were asked if you assumed that Chloe Chandler had no seizures during her e episode, her death. No, I can't assume that. When you note that the movement that would come from a suspended hanging or even a partial suspended hanging uh, are not the type of injuries you'd see here, if, if you saw such injuries, strike that, I'll rephrase. When you note that the movement that is typically found in a hanging does not result in the injuries we see here on the neck, internal. Are you just assuming that, or what informs your opinion on that issue? My opinion is based on my experience, as well as the medical literature that describes that in hangings, the most common thing to find in the anterior neck is no injury or minor injury, usually to the side, often of the sternocleidomastoid, that large muscle to the side. Um, but to have bilateral hemorrhages on, um, at all levels of the strap muscle and the carotids and the vocalis muscle is very common. Um, it's, I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen it, um, but it would be expected to be under circumstances of some um, unusual situation. For instance, um, I saw a case of, of more hemorrhage than I would expect to find. I can't re recall um, exactly how much, but it was an adult who uh, had hanged himself, and I was concerned about the hemorrhage in the neck. And then I found out that the scene had evidence that he had um, had a belt ligature that had broken 
So there was an additional belt at the scene that was broken near his body, and he, he was hanging by a second ligature. So that first ligature broke and caused that friction caused injury. And so I saw more hemorrhage than usual. So that's the kind of situation where a hanging can result in injury um, that's more than expected. But to have, again, bilateral, multiple layers with the carotid artery injury, with the vocalis muscle injury, with the posterior neck injury, um, with the laryngeal petechiae is not common. I mean, say not common, you yourself have not seen that in the literature or seen that in your own experience in conducting autopsies. Not in a typical hanging, no. A suspension hanging. You were asked about static hanging. What, to your knowledge, if any, is, does that mean as a term? I have not heard that term in forensic literature. Um, if I've seen it, it's not something that I've uh, kept uh, in my memory because it's certainly not referred to typically. So I, I really don't know the definition of that. As far as the ligature that was alleged to be part of this hanging pair of pants, Is it possible, based on what you saw physically on Chloe Chandler, and when I say possible, I mean reasonably certain as far as your findings as a medical expert, is it possible if they were rolled up that they would cause the type of injuries we see? And when I say rolled up, I mean you know twisted, however you wish to think. Uh, is it possible in this situation? I would think that on the outside, yes, it's possible. And why do you make that specification? Because there were um, areas of clearing and undulation of the ligature furrow that would suggest that if it were a cloth ligature, that it was, um, it had multiple wrinkles in it um, or some. Uh, variation in texture more than what would be expected from fabric texture. I guess I'll ask you to clarify, when you say more than you would expect, are you saying that a bunching of the pants in this situation would not create those types of injuries, or are you saying that yes, they would? I think they could, correct. But they could result in undulations of the fabric where there are the oval gray areas of clearing alternating with the areas of abrasion and erythema. Um, they weren't a regular pattern as might be seen with a twisted rope that has a periodicity of um, a pattern abrasion but they were irregular, undulating, um, alternating without symmetry. So a bunch or gathered um, ligature would certainly be in keeping with that finding. So if that's the case, why did you reject the history that was reported of Chloe Chandler hanging and dying from that hanging on her pants. The external injury, while possible, was more um, pronounced and not as uh, was more pronounced than usual for a walk ligature, where oftentimes you may see very little or nothing in the way of a ligature furrow, and the pattern of uh, horizontal plus an intersecting angle of the canted component, again, would be a bit unusual, but possible. But the internal injury
are not in keeping with uh, a simple suspension by block ligation without some other factor. For instance, if there could have been something that caught the ligature and uh, caused it to be wrenched away from the neck, like if it were caught in a wheel or um, some other factor were present that would account for the friction and injury expected within the neck, then it would be possible that in a simple suspension with a block ligature, I would not expect the injuries that I saw. Since in your answer, to some extent, you leave the door open to certain possibilities, is Chloe Chandler going through a severe seizure during the hanging as reported account for the type of internal injuries you saw? You know, as I mentioned, most hanging victims probably have some kind of seizure that doesn't move the ligature across the neck. And you were asked, sorry, continue. Well, the weight of the head and the body would fix the literature somewhat. Um, and again, it can slip with gravity, but it doesn't cause um, the multiple layers and multiple locations, both vertically and depth-wise, that are present. You were asked about intubation possibly causing the injuries that you saw deep within the neck. Why do you note, if I understood correctly, that that is not uh, in keeping with your autopsy findings? Well, neck injury can um, be caused by um, intubation. Most of the time, we see that in adults who have um, bleeding disorders disorders or in um, people who uh, have been face down or um, have other fights with children. Um, I see a lot of uh, children with tubes. In fact, even children who are clearly dead when emergency people arrive there is usually an effort to resuscitate them anyway. And so most of the children that we see have uh, been intubated. And it's very rare. I can't recall having seen neck injury due to intubation or neck injury in a child that didn't have a reason for neck injury, such as a hanging or strangulation. So it's you know, some injury can occur. Uh, certainly, injury can occur if, if uh, resuscitation is done improperly. Then some injury can occur. But again, I can't recall a child with neck injury. I see. And concerning the specific neck injury that is found in Chloe Chandler, though you acknowledge that neck injury can occur from two. Uh, from intubation, would intubation cause the neck injuries in the locations that they're found from your autopsy of Chloe Chandler? I did not believe so. And why not? Well, typically when there is um, pressure in intubation, there's pressure on the cricopid cartilage, that little cartilage that's ring line under the tracheal cartilage. So even if there were pressure applied against a tube causing some injury, I would expect it in the middle of the neck. Um, I would, and again, I don't usually see injury in children. Um, it, it doesn't fit in my opinion. Nothing further, Your Honor. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. 
You're probably going to have to sit there if you want to hear you. Dr. Cavalier, just so the court is clear, on cross-examination, you agreed with me when I told you that traumatic intubations can result in internal injuries of the deep musculature of the larynx, which often mimic the injuries of strangulation, correct? They can be present in places that strangulation injury occurs, but the pattern here is not one that I would expect from intubation, particularly in a child. At all levels of, there would be no reason to put pressure on the carotid arteries during intubation. Um, she had injury of both carotid arteries. She had injury of both sides of the neck uh, and, and injury at the top and the bottom. So I can't imagine intubation of a child that would result. Now, you've testified previously that regarding the injuries that you observed on Chloe Chandler's body, a person would not have had to carry those injuries out. They just didn't match the history. Isn't that correct? I don't know what you mean by carried out. Could you ask that in a different way, please? Sure. During your uh, hearing testimony on February the 21st of 2020, there was a discussion about um, movement of the ligature, and you were asked a question about, well, what if a fan grabbed the scarf or something mechanical that would cause that? And you were asked, would that essentially mean that a person would have to have carry this out? And your response was, no, if there was another explanation, I would consider that. You recall that? Yes. So this, the injuries that you observed didn't necessarily have to come at the hands of another person, correct? No, if there was another explanation that would fit the injuries, then I would certainly consider that, and I would hope I would know it. For instance, if there was a mechanical device that altered a ligature um, such that some uh, ligature was caught in it and pulled across Chloe's neck, then I would want to know it and that could possibly explain what happened. But I have heard nothing that would explain uh, this injury other than, uh, nothing relevant other than what was uh, described by us. And in conclusion, doctor, while you may not favor it, you cannot completely rule out an accidental hanging in this case, can you? Objection goes to the prior motion I only that the defense themselves raised. Just a minute, just a minute. There's been an objection, and I wasn't able to hear the objection because the witness is still talking. Dr. Cavalier, if you could hold off. Uh, Dr. Cavalier, I'm sorry you missed an objection, so we need to get that sorted out. Your Honor, if the defense objects and though it wasn't officially ruled on by the court, but it appeared the court was in line with the objection of manner of death not being testified to, that being accident, homicide, things of that nature. If the defense is to object to it successfully and then ask if they can't rule out an accident, which goes to manner of death, which goes to their motion of limit that they're intentionally trying to keep out, I would ask that they not be able to ask that since it's essentially a violation of their own motion. To stay. Dr. Cavalier, can you rule out a hanging in this case? I believe there was suspension as part of the injury. I do not believe this is consistent with a sim simple suspension hanging. I have no further questions. Any other questions for this witness, Mr. No, no? Oh, sorry, Your Honor. Uh, no, Your Honor, and uh, Dr. Cavalier, unless 
opposing counsel wishes to keep her, we, uh, we are done. So you've indicated um, this witness can be excused. Witness can be excused, Your Honor. So, um, Dr. Cavalier, we are done with your testimony. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. You're excused. Thank you. We'll take a 15-minute break and resume at 3 o'clock. Thank you, Your Honor.